So what I'm going to talk about uh, is a little bit of sort of some of the work that we've been doing in the last several years. And in the end, I'll sort of uh, talk about some of the things that we will be doing in the near future with the hope that we'll get an opportunity to work with many of you. When we think of uh, AMR, um, we think um, in oftentimes in the context of high income countries, um, and I want to talk a little bit about low income countries. But before I do that, I want to sort of give credit to the students who have really sort of made uh, this work possible and have worked with uh, me and, and the lab and our partners. Um, that's Car Dr. Carly Ching, Dr. Sam Marubu, Enrika Sutradhar, um, Dr. Zohar Weinstein on the right, and in the bottom, Dr. Drash Desai, Dr. Andrew Acevedo, and Dr. Sandra Amoyed. And so I'll be presenting parts of their work in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes. When we think of antimicrobial resistance, um, it's a global burden. It's one that continues to uh, be of highest global importance. Um, we are already seeing a high number of cases already, and these are going to increase. Some projections, and, and there are some details about whether those projections are overestimate or an underestimate, suggest that uh, we will see at the current rate a significant decrease in livestock in the next um, 20 or 30 years, um, significant financial losses, but more importantly, we will see an impact uh, that is significant in low and middle income countries. And that is sort of the main thing I wanna talk about is how do we think about the challenges in low and middle income countries, looking at traditional aspects of it. So uh, community acquired infection or hospital inf acquired infection, but other parameters that we may often not think about. I grew up in Pakistan myself. Um, I have family there, work there, um, but also I work in a number of sort of other low and middle income countries and refugee camps. And I'll talk about that um, as, we, as we go. There are two specific things that I want to focus on in the context of today's conversation that are often not addressed in the context of uh, high income countries. One is the role of environment, so sewage, um, wastewater, urban wastewater in particular, and the other aspect is drug quality, the aspect associated with uh, poor quality or counterfeit medicines. How do we think about those? How do they lead into policy in, in our work? And how does policy sort of impact that research. So in the first 10 or 12 minutes, I'll talk about the scientific aspect of environment and drug quality work, and then sort of talk about in the next five or six minutes of, of how it leads into policy. So let's start with the environmental aspect. Some of the places where I work in Pakistan, this is in urban Karachi, and, um, and you see sort of wastewater. This is a place called uh, Machar Colony, uh, a community of uh, stateless Bengalis in Pakistan, sort of facing xenophobia, exclusion, tremendous racism, and forced to live by the sea in a reclaimed land and sort of around, around um, sort of uh, wastewater and sewage. So this is from a, a place where I work. Um, other places in Pakistan and elsewhere have been the centers of uh, development of new and extensively drug resistant infections. So XDR typhoid that started in Southern port city um, of Hyderabad started in sort of urban wastewater. And with the floods in Pakistan right now, there is continued concern about some of these things emerging as well, because there's tremendous concern about wastewater, about water quality, emergence of new infectious diseases. So environment continues to play a role that is often underappreciated. What I'm going to talk about today is something slightly different than simple environment surveillance, but talk about how does one model using mathematics and computational modeling, using data from the ground, um, the emergence of these uh, new infections, what does it say about sort of the likelihood? Can you predict what might be happening? Can you simulate these things first in a computer model, then in a lab, and then see what might be happening? The model is actually relatively simple. I'm a strong believer in simple models that make sense. Even when the mathematics gets complicated, at least intellectually, they should make sense. The idea of the model is simple. There are three kinds of inputs environmental parameters, which means sort of antimicrobial residues, bacterial concentration, flow of water, if there's any bacterial parameters, growth rate, mutations, things like that, um, antibiotic parameters, synergy, bacterial killing rates, things like that, and some parameters in the environment about the presence of fecal matter. The output is we are interested in seeing how the population of bacteria develops that is resistant from chromosomal mutations, population of bacteria that develops um, because of um, antimicrobial resistance genes over time and the change in susceptible bacteria population over time. So the model is relatively simple. We can put the parameters 
as you see fit based on the community that we work um, in and then sort of see how it really works. Um, given the time, I won't go through the entire detail, but I want to give you a sense on the kinds of things these models can do. Um, I won't go through the mathematics of this, but these are ordinary differential equations. So even if you're not interested or are uh, sort of uh, attuned to these things, these can be easily programmed, even in Excel for that matter. What we also do is we have a continuous flow chamber where we can simulate these things. We can add antibiotics, we can take antibiotics away, we can add um, sort of organic matter, we can take organic matter away, we can change temperature. And what we have seen is we can, uh, we are, in this case, we're looking at uh, rifampicin and strep. Um, on the uh, left-hand side are the equations, uh, sorry, are the data from the, the lab. On the right-hand side is the data from the model. And we can sort of see how the sensitive population changes over time, how um, uh, resistance to combination appears, how resistance to rifampicin only appears, how resistance to strep only appears. And so, so give, this gives us a little bit of confidence in, in the model as well as we build and start to collect sort of local parameters. Then we started looking at um, what is the role of horizontal gene transfer versus chromosomal mutations. And what we noticed was something that you would expect, but we can sort of be slightly more specific. We noticed that horizontal gene transfer is observed to be the dominant mode of resistance in agreement with patterns reported in studies of E. coli and other settings, as well as in the field. And increase, increase, sorry, increase antibiotic residue concentration, decrease the time to resistant population. So based on where you are, whether you have high levels of antibiotic pollution or low levels of antibiotic pollution, they play a role in addition to the organic matter that may, might be there. We can also see the levels of um, antibiotic interactions on AMR development. So we can vary um, and on the left-hand side, you can see the concentration in case that there is high levels of concentration. And on the right-hand side, you can see what happens when there is low levels of concentration. We can see synergy, so antibiotics that are synergistic to each other, as well as antibiotics that may be less synergistic. And now we're sort of extending this work in sort of urban sewage in Pakistan and in South Africa, including sort of metal dependence as well. So we can look at the effect of synergy, time to resistant population, uh, for super inhibitory um, antibiotic residue concentration and resistant population for sub inhibitory uh, antibiotic residu residue concentration. So we can start to model these things. And the reason to model is not necessarily to capture what is happening, but also to be able to inform local authorities, places that may have a higher risk of development of pathogens that may be drug resistant. The other dimension, and again, these are uh, I mean, these are sort of overviews of what we are um, um, uh, sort of uh, giving you a sense on what, what we are going to look at. Um, the other issue that I think is important and is often underappreciated is uh, drug quality. So whether you are in sort of a conflict setting, in this case, Syria, or you are in low income countries, there are real issues of drug quality. So in, uh, on the top right and uh, left side, you see poor manufacturing. On the bottom right, you see um, at, uh, you see um, uh, the presence of uh, specific and, and intentional falsification. On the top right is a picture that I took um, almost a year later of drugs that, <clears throat> that were well past the expiry date. And on the bottom right, you see lack of local regulatory authority in terms of drugs. And all of these things together contribute to the presence of antimicrobial resistance. So my, my sort of question here is twofold. Can we see in the lab what um, uh, poor quality medicines do to development of resistance? And two, can we use that information so uh, to, um, uh, to do some... Uh, um, uh, policy planning on that. Uh, poor quality medicines make up anywhere from 10 to 30% of drugs uh, globally when it comes to antibiotics, leads to uh, hundreds of thousands of deaths and of course significant uh, financial impact as well in addition to drug resistance. So the first question is the scientific ones, right? So we are interested in the molecular mechanism. How do poor quality medicines lead to um, antimicrobial resistance? So one of them is that drugs can be substandard in a variety of ways, um, high levels of um, uh, active ingredient, low levels of um, active ingredient, excipients that may be right or not, and then um, impurities um, as well. So I'm gonna uh, focus specifically on degradation products. 
again, we are looking at here um, an example of rifampicin. We have looked at Cipro and other cases as well, but rifampicin auto uh, oxidizes in the presence of high heat or in, in poor storage condition and leads to a product called rifampicin quinone. Now, rifampicin itself is uh, a drug that is used. Rifampicin quinone is considered to be a substandard um, impurity. And what we did was we sort of exposed rifampicin quinone and rifampicin together to both E. coli and to um, uh, Mycobacteria sphingmatis and noticed that the presence of even small amounts of this impurity, rifampicin quinone, leads to rapid development of resistance, right? So even when you have small amounts of the drug, you can lead to, you can develop resistance fast, both in case of uh, E. coli and in the case of rifampicin of, um, uh, of Mycobacterium sphingmatis, demonstrating that poor quality medicines can lead uh, to, to resistance in the laboratory. We then investigated further and looked at uh, the genes, and in this case, in the RPO uh, B cluster that is known to have sort of resistant genes, we noticed sort of mutations that were well known, as well as novel mutations again in E. coli, as well as in, in the case of Mycobacterium uh, sphingmatis. So here we are saying that we can start to find mechanisms that are associated specifically with a challenge that is often underappreciated and present in low-income countries, and that is of poor quality medicines. We then investigated further and went into Cipro. In this case, we looked at uh, impurities that are often there in the manufacturing process, um, uh, that is Ciprofloxacin and HCL, fluorocholinolonic acid, and CEA, Ciprofloxacin, Ethylene, um, ethylene diamine analog. And in this case is, again, we notice that even presence of those um, can lead to poor quality, sorry, uh, can, can lead to development of resistance here. Uh, red means killing and green means that the bacteria are able to survive. So um, impurities can promote resistance, primarily driven by um, ciprofloxacin and um, sort of uh, um, degradation products or impurities that are in there. And then we can sort of really see that these things can be a factor in developing resistance. So even when you are controlling for, for example, people taking antibiotics for the right amount of time, uh, the fact that poor quality medicines are available in the market, even good sort of dosage or regimen can lead to development of at least low levels of resistance, making them sort of high um, from uh, vulnerable for, uh, to that uh, um, development of resistance. And, and, and what we've looked at it is that can also lead to multi-drug resistance as well. I want to sort of change gears in the last eight um, or so minutes and, and think about can you use this information to do something meaningful? Um, can we sort of inform local authorities, local policymakers, and, and sort of think about it? So uh, in this case, what we did was uh, we looked at a number of countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Ghana, Nepal, uh, Nigeria, uh, Pakistan, and Uganda, which are in a, in a relatively similar sort of either geographic setting, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, or in a similar GDP window. Um, as well. And what we were looking at in general, are there sort of, uh, is there an interest uh, in the government on addressing some of these concerns, whether it is sort of environmental action or whether it is uh, sort of improving drug qualities. And in most cases, what we noticed was that there was some interest, but not a whole lot, right? So, so the things that we were seeing in the laboratory and in the field were not reflected in the national action plans. Um, for example, um, uh, in the national sort of uh, guidelines for uh, national action plans or, or, or uh, sort of procurement, um, Afghanistan, Nepal, and Pakistan did not have any mention of GMP, good manufacturing practices in that regard, um, and, and other things, so on and so forth. Um, oops, sorry. So that tells you that there are actual gaps that are specific uh, that need to be addressed um, in, 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 in these cases. So we are sort of again now going to, so as I said, we, we go from science to policy and then policy back to science and research. So we said, okay, is there something that we can do meaningfully uh, to address this issue? And one of those is, can you detect poor quality medicines um, in, in the environment or poor quality medicines in, in the market? In that case, now we're going to wear, uh, wear sort of a, uh, a technology development hat. Um, and 
sort of think about what are the technologies out there? What can you do to address some of these concerns? So the existing field solutions to detect poor quality medicines are either very bulky, they're, they're heavy, um, they are often very uh, sort of cumbersome, or they are quite expensive, right? So, so there's a need for things that are uh, locally driven, locally designed, um, or at least locally contextually appropriate. And, uh, and out of that uh, came our work that we've been sort of involved in for the last several years um, to develop new technologies and that we call that PharmaCheck. And the idea of PharmaCheck is that if we want to improve uh, access to good quality medicines um, all over the world at all points in the supply chain, regardless of uh, who you are, regardless of where you live, your, your ethnic origin, or, or any other discriminatory factors. Specifically, there were four uh, aspects that we wanted to address. The first one was uh, developing a needs assessment. Um, uh, the second one is developing technology innovation. Can we address uh, these solutions through technology? Using that to improve policy and eventually long-term goal is to redu reduce uh, adverse effects from um, uh, sort of health outcomes and, and support economic and development of people living in areas with limited pharmaceutical regulatory oversight. The technology is actually relatively straightforward and simple. It's about the size of a laptop case. Um, it weighs about, I would say, five kilos, about 10, 12 pounds. And, and the idea is that accurately and affordably tests uh, the quality of medicines at all points in the supply chain. Um, the underlying sort of science of that is that we have developed a series of molecules called aptamers that would bind specifically to the active ingredient, give off a signal, and that signal corresponds to how much active ingredient is in there. We can also measure it as a function of time, and that allows us to really see how the drug is released and measure the um, dissolution profile. The aptamers are DNA or RNA molecules with tight um, specificity. They're streamlined for any, um, any, any, any target. And then um, there is tunable fluorescent signal on binding as well. So um, the current system has a simplified user experience. Um, you have a cartridge. So if you're interested in, in a drug that is anti-TB, you would have a specific cartridge for that. You're looking for anti-malarial uh, specific cartridges for that. And they sort of come fully customized. And all you have to do is to plug it in and, and let the system run. Um, if you look under the under the hood, so to speak, um, it's um, sort of meant to be fully self-sustained, along with sort of waste management from the environmental standpoint. Currently, we can do pretty much all of the anti-malarials and, 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 and quite a few antibiotics as well um, that are available in the market. Um, here is sort of just showing Cipro and tetracycline um, that we can sort of measure different brands, different packages, and here's the data of tetracycline with aptamer giving a specific signal, nothing with blank, nothing with tetracycline alone, and nothing with aptamer alone. Okay. Um, looking at sort of the field data, we can, we can do better than existing WHO protocols. And while we don't uh, argue that our system is going to be a replacement for HPLC, we are certainly within the range so that it eases the burden of the regulatory authorities. Um, at uh, to, to test the quality of medicines. So when I say that we want to do things at the systems level, what I mean is that we do want to go, do good science, but also work with local regulatory authorities so that there's a change in policy so that they're, they're able to do things better than how it's done right now. Um, these are sort of some of the pictures of our training programs in Ghana and in Indonesia and elsewhere. Um, and so uh, our goal here um, and I'll finish in a, in a couple of minutes, is that we want to create a new field standard, not a new gold standard, but a new field standard, providing more relevant results for the context. So if, for example, you're working in a country that has specific challenge with antibiotics, we are able to address those. In another country, we are able to address those, and we can do so at a much lower cost. So I want to conclude, um, I'm cognizant of the time, um, I want to conclude um, with, with three thoughts. The first one is that medicine quality remains an unappreciated topic and antimicrobial resistance, particularly in low and middle income countries. Um, this is a topic that is related not just to AMR, but also quality of care and of um, issues associated with, uh, for example, uh, quality of um, um, care in terms of equity. People who are socioeconomically disadvantaged often tend to be getting worse medicines. So there's there's an element there here of, of injustice as well. Um, 
Another area that oftentimes is underappreciated is environmental contamination. And it needs to be studied with rigorous, novel, and multidisciplinary tools. And, and, and perhaps one of the things that we have been worried about and, and trying to address that is that oftentimes the data around these things uh, remains very limited, remains very scant, um, and hence uh, remains a barrier in enacting change. And we want to sort of address that. Where do we go from there? So I want to spend the last couple of minutes in thinking about where do we go from there? So the next set of challenges that we are very interested in is um, tools, development of tools that are fit for purpose of discovery, analysis, and impact, and not necessarily relying on sort of non-customizable tools um, that are just sort of used because they're, they're just available and are not able to provide specific and relevant results. The second one is we want to be able to use these tools and policies so that people have access to quality health services um, and, and really uh, quality in, in, in a sense of equity and equality. Um, environment remains a major issue. And we see this um, both in terms of global environments, so global climate change, but also local environments, sewage and wastewater and, and other challenges. And of course, finally, that I'll spend the last minute on, is this issue of um, environment and conflict really playing uh, a synergistic role, a, a, a nexus, um, uh, and forcing people to move out of their homes, creating refugees and internally displaced people, and, and their health uh, certainly is of concern. And so um, one idea is to really think about in terms of One Health, we've written a little bit about that, um, but One Health would remain a dream without sort of the appropriate development of tools and basic science. It sounds great policy, but on the back end really needs good science, good, uh, good technology, good sort of approaches. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about today is the development of a new center that I will be directing at Boston University. It's called Center on Forced Displacement, and it brings together scholars and uh, from all over campus, artists and philosophers, social scientists and humanists, um, public health uh, researchers and engineers and scientists together to really address thinking about this issue of people who are forced out of their homes. Uh, we will have a number of sort of fellowships and, and uh, visitors opportunities, as well as internships and projects. And I hope um, this, this will, uh, the website will go online later today, and I'm happy to send it to Esther and Clarissa to share. We'll have sort of a number of these programs that I hope you all are able to engage given sort of the importance of global health as a central theme on many issues of uh, forced displacement. So Esther asked me to think about what global health research is. When, when I think of it, I, I consider it to be inclusive, not just dominated by science or, or public health, but, but really inclusive, bringing aspects of humanities and social sciences as well, to understanding, improving health and well-being of all people, wherever they are, um, with three main criteria. One is that our approaches need have to have to be ethical. Two, they have to be rigorous. And third, they have to be contextually appropriate with a deep appreciation of social, historical, and cultural context. Um, I know I, I, I tried to cover a lot, so it was perhaps fast, and, and my apologies. Um, so I'll end here with a great appreciation and thanks for the people who've done this work, um, as well as funding agencies. Um, looking forward to speaking to you in both the uh, breakout sessions and the conversation afterwards. Thank you very much.